stand for the call to worship. Make known to us the power of the coming Christ. We are eyewitnesses to majesty. Hear the voice come from heaven to announce the beloved. We are the receivers of God's glory and honor. Confirm the prophetic message more fully in our presence. We are attendants to this light until the day dawns and the morning star rises. Let us worship God's majesty, glory, honor, and prophetic light. Amen. to climb a hill for you, O God, but we gather to worship you in this place. We may never see you transfigured in glory in our presence, but we witness your transforming power in our living. We may not have the words to explain all that you are, but we have hearts that want to worship all that you are. And enable us to meet you in your glory around us, that we may worship you faith from the statement uh, from the new creed that you'll find printed in the bulletin we are not alone we live in God's world we believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus Christ the word made flesh 
to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Glory be. Peace of God be with you. I want to give the prize to Kevin and Carol Garris. On a day like this, they made it all the way from Wren. I think we should give them applause. <laughs> and turn and welcome one another and, and congratulate each other on being here on a snowy, snowy day. <laughs>
Old Testament reading today is from the book of Psalm, Psalm 99. The Lord is king and the people tremble. He sits on his throne above the winged creatures and the earth shakes. The Lord is mighty in Zion. He is supreme over all the nations. Everyone will praise his great and majestic name. Holy is he. Mighty king, you love what is right. You have established justice in Israel. You have brought righteousness and fairness. Praise the Lord, O our God. Worship before his throne. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were his priests, and Samuel was one who prayed to him. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them from the pillar of cloud. They obeyed the laws and commands that he gave them. O oh Lord, our God, you answered your people. You showed them that you are a God who forgives, even though you punish them for their sins. Praise the Lord, our God, and worship at his sacred hill. The Lord, our God, is holy. Our second reading from the New Testament is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. We have not depended on made-up stories in making known to you the mighty coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. With our own eyes, we saw his greatness. We were there when he was given honor and glory by God the Father, when the voice came to him from the supreme glory, saying, this is my own dear son with whom I am pleased. We ourselves heard this voice coming from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we are even more confident of the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will do well to pay attention to it because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all else, however, remember that no one can explain by himself a prophecy in the scriptures, for no prophetic message ever came just from the will of man. But men were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. Today I will be reading from the book of Psalm, chapter 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? From the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, from 17th chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and the brothers James and John and led them up on a high mountain where they were alone. And as they looked on, a change came over Jesus. His face was shining like the sun, his clothes dazzling white. And then the three disciples saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So. Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, Lord, how good it is that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was talking, a shining cloud came over them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my own dear son, with whom I am pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard the voice, they were so terrified that they threw themselves faceward on the ground. Jesus came to them and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And so they looked up and saw no one but Jesus there. And as they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Don't tell anyone about this vision that you have seen until the Son of Man has, seen, has been raised from the dead. Then the disciples asked Jesus, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah has to come first? Elijah is indeed coming first, answered Jesus, and he will get everything ready. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and people did not recognize him, but treated him just as they pleased. In the same way, they will also mistreat the Son of Man. And then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of this God's holy word. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. Yo. Are you going to teach your new brother how to say that? I bet you will, that's for sure. I know. You got a baby brother. Is that great? A new baby brother. You got, you got a baby brother? Oh, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Hey, you know what? Your Bible verse for Sunday school today, it asks you, you know, when you've got God on your side and when you've got God's love and all that stuff going for you, it says, the person who wrote it, what shall I fear? Do you realize that? You know, there's lots of things we get afraid of, you know. We fear, we wonder about sometimes, don't you? Do you have things that you fear sometimes? You're afraid might happen or you're there's something that scares you and you wonder about it, you know. Well, the thing to remember is the Bible teaches that, that it doesn't matter what goes on around us. It doesn't matter what there is in the world that could frighten us. When you've got God on your side, you don't have to be afraid of anything. God is there with you, no matter what goes on in the world. When you hear about bad things going on, when you hear about stuff happening to people and stuff, yeah, sometimes that's the way the world is. But God on your side will always be with you and help you face whatever it is you're afraid of. You know, sometimes you're afraid of it, like you guys that are in school, sometimes you're afraid of a test that's coming up. Has that ever happened to anybody? Yeah. You're in school too? Yeah. Oh, little yeah. The little ones, yeah, they know all about that too. But when you take a test, have you ever been afraid of a test coming up? Ah, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an affirmative, right, right? Yeah, or spelling test or something like a math test or something like that. Math is my big problem too, yeah, especially algebra. You know, and then I had to go and take analysis, trigonometry, and all that stuff so I could preach. <laughs> How's that? All those kind of math, you know. Oh, well, we, are, we do get afraid of things. Just trust that God will be with you. When you face whatever's fearful, whatever hurts you or afraid of, that you're afraid of, trust that God will get you through it. God will help you get, if it's a tough test coming, if it's you're frightened about something that's going on in your life or you're afraid for somebody else pray to God and God will help you get through it okay okay let's pray with me okay God we know you help us get through many things certainly the parents and grandmas and grandpas out here in front of the kids can tell them lots of stories about how you have helped us get through things that we've had to face in our lives as we grew up too and we face as adults too we ask God that you'd be with our children whenever they face a trial or a tribulation or something that worries them or frightens them, be with them and help them get through that and know that you are there to help them and be through all the trouble they face. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming up. I want to say, uh, I picked on Karen, uh, Carol and Kevin, <laughs> you got here, but you might not get back. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, the way things are going. I was up north for a couple days, and uh, Thursday morning at 5.30 in the morning, it was 16.5 degrees below zero at Wixom Lake. And 45 minutes above us at Houghton Lake, it was 28 below zero. That was um, Friday morning. So, uh, you know, it's in, that's unusual for March even up there. That's really unusual. So it's interesting to see. And the, and the snow was high and I had to dig my way in. 
That's all there is to it. So anyhow, Grace Young dropped something off at my office the other day. A small boy asked his mother, where do people come from? His mother answered, God made us out of dust. The boy then asked, well, where do we go when we die? His mother replied, we go back to dust. Completely appropriate subject uh, given that we have, you know, Ash Wednesday coming up. A few days later, the little boy was playing on the bedroom floor and he began to call out loudly for his mother. She came quickly and she asked what he wanted. He said, there's a whole lot of people under this bed, but I can't, get, I can't tell whether they're coming or going. That's a cute story. Among the greatest experiences of my life was being present at the birth of each of my two children. Now, when my first child was born, I had to sign a whole lot of documents, you know, because it was like an operating theater that we were in. And basically, I signed my life away saying, you know, if I fell over or passed out or something, you could kick me around like a piece of meat, you know. Didn't want, you know, they didn't like the idea that my wife and I wanted to be in there together. They really didn't. They best dressed me up like some kind of a surgeon or something like that and put the mask on me, and there I was. It had changed. By the time my son was born, it was totally different. It was the doctor and me and my wife and the baby and an intern who came in late and complained that they had started the birth before he got there. And Dr. Yoder looked at him and said, I won't repeat what he said, who the, do you think you are? <laughs> this baby's going to come whether you want him, her to come, him to come or not. It's going to happen. You should have been here earlier. But I got to watch. And with my own ears, with my own eyes, I saw them come into the world. And with my own ears, I heard their very first cry. The memories of their very first moments out in this world are permanently seared on my mind. Once you see something like that, it doesn't, it doesn't leave you. It's something you want to hold on to. Now they're 42 and 37, and I still remember. I remember that. I could never forget it. And that's an example, I believe, much like what Peter felt when with James and John, he witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus. He'd experienced nothing like it before in his life. The memory of that unique experience was permanently branded on his mind. It was an experience unlike any that he had ever seen before, unlike any he would ever seen afterwards, except for maybe the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Peter was there, James and John, and Jesus upon the mountain to pray. And suddenly, Jesus was changed. Suddenly, he was transformed. Suddenly, he was wearing a, a robe that was whiter than any launderer could make a robe be anywhere, anytime, any place. And then joining him there, not only that, was Moses and Elijah. Moses for the law, Elijah for the prophets. Talking to each other. Peter was overwhelmed. He couldn't believe what he was looking at. He had never seen, of course, anything like it before. And suddenly it struck him so that he realized, well, you know, we need to stay here. This is a good place to be. We need to stay here and worship here and stay on this mountain and build a shrine here, and that's what we're going to do. When something good really happens, you want to hold on to it. You want to keep it. You know, that's why men and women get married find a good wife, you find a good husband, you want that. You want to hold on to it. It, it if it's husbands, she if it's a her, if it's a wife. <laughs> Guys get what I mean. <laughs> you find like those people in California walking across their land and they suddenly dug up a bunch of tins full of gold coins worth millions of dollars. I'm sure they wanted to hold on to that. Couldn't wait to get to the bank or wherever they went with them. You know, that's what Peter was feeling. 
Now, we don't know what James and John were feeling, but Peter's talking about that in 1 Peter, what he experienced. An example of something that was so marvelous that you just can't let it go. Decades later, Peter would call upon that memory and essentially say to the world, listen, we were there. We saw it with our own eyes. We saw Jesus changed. We were there with our own ears. We heard the voice from heaven proclaim him to be God's beloved son. And so Peter calls upon his eyewitness account from out of his life's experience with Jesus of Nazareth to say to the world that what he and the other followers of Jesus were there, who were there with him experienced was not just a story made up by somebody like there are in other religions, he was saying, not a myth that a group of people concocted. What happened, he said, instead was a truth witnessed by a group of people with their own eyes and with their own ears. Jesus' life and the actions that occurred during that life as told by those who followed him, uh, Peter was saying, were first-hand experiences. It's not a dream, not even a vision. What the disciples saw and heard happened in real life time before their very eyes because as Peter says we were there they were there when Jesus cleansed the leper they were there when Jesus healed the centurion's servant they were there when Jesus calmed the storm of the sea they were there when he healed the blind man who had been blind, born blind, blind his whole life. They were there when he was transfigured on the mountain. The disciples were there when he spoke to them outside of the empty tomb. They were there when he appeared to them, risen from the dead in the upper room. They were there when, risen from the dead, he sat with them on the beach and he ate breakfast, ate fish and bread. They were there and they watched him as he ascended into heaven. With their own eyes, they saw it all. With their own ears, they heard it all. They were there. It's kind of like somebody talking to you about grandma and grandpa. You never met them. They died before you were born. My grandma and grandpa's I have one grandpa who was a Creek Indian. Now, he died when my mother was a year old, but I only have one picture of him holding my Uncle Ray. That's all I know about him. And then Grandma, I know. She lived to be 97 years old, and I have a picture of her holding my first grandchild on her lap. That's five generations that that picture represents. But then I don't know Ballard, Mills, and I don't know Lucinda Shrewsbury, but I do know them because my family told me about them, told me the things that they said, told me what they were like, told me who they were, what, what, they, what they shared in common with them because they were eyewitnesses. Well, because my mom tells me these stories or told me these stories and my dad tells me stories about his family, because I wasn't there, does that mean it wasn't true? We each become, in a sense, a kind of a jury weighing the evidence presented from eyewitness accounts. I've been called to jury service in my lifetime eight times. My dad hasn't been called once. I think they're getting the wrong Eddie Bray. He has all the time in the world. You know what I'm saying? I haven't had to do service but on two of those juries. But you know, when you go to jury service, what you do is you're, you're going to listen to testimony. And the one jury that I was on was a federal case, and I listened to testimony. And what it was was an anti-discrimination case where a woman felt discriminated in 
her, her work that she was doing in a college and she felt that she should have been paid more and she was right. And the president of the college was wrong because we, the jury, said so. He ended up getting fired. I suppose it was maybe because of what we said was right and wrong. But eyewitness evidence is important in that. Eyewitness evidence comes to where a jury sits and listens and hears what people have heard, what people have seen, and they decide from what they hear in that testimony what is truth. So we in our own lives, we stand kind of as a jury, you know, in our own deliberation. When we talk about who God is, when we talk about who Jesus Christ is, when we talk about what our faith is about, we are kind of like a jury on our own because we each have to take a look at it and think about the truth of it. What are these people saying that is true? What Peter is saying to you and to me in the book of Peter, we were there. We saw this happen. It's not a figment of our imagination. Well, we have therefore two options. We either accept the testimony or we reject it. Now, a lot of people like to live between those two options. A lot of people who call themselves Christians like to live, you know, between this area, this kind of gray area, and say, okay, well, I can take that and I can take this. And we think we're going to be okay. Jesus said at one point, you know, or God said, You've got to be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I just spit you out. You ever had a lukewarm cup of coffee? Of course, I know there's some of those who like cappuccino and who like, I know some of those who like iced coffee. But real coffee drinkers, when you have your coffee, you want it hot and strong and good. God's saying, you know, you've got to make a choice in your life. What's going to be more important, being a follower or not being a follower? Being one who believes or one who doesn't believe? What's the choice that you're going to make? So you see, when we look at these eyewitness accounts and we get the Gospels, the, the four Gospels, and we get these things that Peter is saying, the things that are written in all of the letters and all, and all that Paul has to say. When we get these accounts, even Paul, who wasn't even one of the original disciples, has an eyewitness account. An eyewitness account where he's on the road to Damascus and Jesus, who had died, been resurrected, and ascended to heaven, confronts Paul as Saul, the guy who tormented Christians, confronts him on that road and he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Even Paul has an eyewitness account. And in his eyewitness, then his sight was taken away from him. What are we going to do with these eyewitnesses? We go on living our lives like they didn't really see anything. We go on living our lives like we really don't have to believe them. But the truth is, as Peter says, they were there. Don't reject it. Believe it. Don't throw it out and say, maybe that's just a story. It's not. It's not a myth. If you're going to ever consider one way or the other, you want to accept the eyewitness testimony as true. Because if you choose to accept the eyewitness testimony, the gain is immeasurable. It's more than you'll ever see in this life. But as someone who follows those testimonies and believes in what those who are there say, you can find peace in your life in the midst of turmoil. You can find wholeness in your life in the midst of struggle. You can have hope of salvation. The story is true. It wasn't made up. It's the only religion in the world where somebody didn't sit down and say, this is what I believe, or this is what I thought and wrote it down. It's what really happened. The man was crucified. 
The man was put in a tomb. He was resurrected from the dead. That happened. The eyewitnesses say that. But people today sometimes think, oh, well, maybe they were hallucinating. Maybe this was happening. Maybe this was going on. Maybe that was happening. No. Peter's saying, look, folk, believe it. It's true. We were there. And what evolves out of that then, finally, is the promise of eternal life. So if we believe the eyewitness accounts, if we follow them, if we believe that Peter was saying in his letter that he and his fellow disciples were there on that mount that day when they saw Jesus transfigured, changed into the glorious and majestic Son of God, if we believe that they saw Moses and Elijah standing with him, if we believe that they heard the voice from heaven proclaiming Jesus as the beloved Son of God, and Peter declares their truth, that's to be truth and not any story that he imagined, not any dream that he dreamed, not any vision that he received, that he saw with his own eyes. If we believe that, eternity is ours. God has a place for us beyond this life. God has a new life for us that's forever. And so accept this truth. Think about it. You have brothers and sisters in Christ who lived 2,000 years ago who thought enough of you to write it down and put in, we put it in a book, they didn't, but write it down in letters in the gospel and so that you would know what they saw, what they heard, what they experienced. They didn't put it down on paper just to tell a fairy tale. They put it down because that's what happened to them. Believe it, receive it, accept it as truth. You'll live forever. Pray with me. Lord, help us to be also transfigured in our lives. Help us to be changed. Help us to be able to be glorified in the majesty that we find in you. Help us to move forward in our lives knowing that the truth is that Christ died for our sins, was resurrected from the dead, and that he now lives, and so shall we. But we've got to believe that. We've got to believe it for it to happen. So help us, God, in our doubt. Help us to be able to serve you and to believe what those early witnesses saw. And help us to praise you in all that we say and in all we do. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, and taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God is good to us, and we can return that good by sharing what we have to give of ourselves. And the things that we have is the non-renewable resource of time. That's an important gift. The greatness of the talents that God has given to each one of us. And the marvelous joy of having wealth that we can share. So what you bring to this place, God blesses, and God will return to you in full measure.
God, we are grateful that we are able to give. We are grateful that you have blessed us so well in so many areas of our lives. And we are sorry for the times that we don't acknowledge that. But we want you to know that you have done wonderful things for us and we're aware of that anyway. And so we lift up before you these gifts that we bring today to help your church to do well in the community, to help people who beyond us need sustenance and housing and clothes, and to do things that together we can only do in a part we would never do, couldn't afford to. So bless these gifts and bless all the hands that prepared it and the households that they represent as we try to bless you with what we do with them and to glorify you in Jesus' name. As you walk from this place, yes, the snow is getting deeper. Yes, it's cold out there. But folks, go get some cross-country skis or get a sled. You know, go have fun with it. Enjoy the beauty of it. In all things God creates, in all things that are around us, even in the cold, there's joy to behold. So go bless the world with your love and bless the world with your compassion and bless the world with your spirit of holiness and helpfulness. And God will bless you. God will transfigure you. And one day your face will shine on God and God's face will shine on you and you will feel God's peace.
tune, tune, tune.